My name is Fraser Allport. I live and work in Vero Beach. I'm a registered investment advisor and certified estate planner, and I carry all of my insurance licenses. I've been in business 33 years. Predominantly, my client is a business owner. And what I've noticed over the years is that business owners, when you sit down with them, are very good at what they do. They make money well, and then they don't know how to manage it properly. And so it's kind of like left hand, right hand. I use the analogy that your left hand, you make money, and your right hand, you manage it. And most business owners go through their day literally doing this. And if you ask a business owner, they can tell you what they're bringing in, and they can't tell you where the money goes. And so I kind of use the analogy that it's almost like out there every day shoveling, and you're shoveling making money, and then you literally throw it over your shoulders, and you don't know where the money goes. And there's a huge gap between your top line and your bottom line. And so this course is all about, I have to get my little thingy here. Oh, there it is. I'm not very techy. This course is all about mastering the money you've already made. Business owners know well the particular trade and craft, but that same business owner does not understand their own business finances. Making money is very different than managing money. And people, again, are good at what they do, bringing the dollar in, and then they don't know where the dollar goes. And this course is all about mastering the money you've already made. It's not a sales and marketing course about the top line, which is actually the hardest thing to do is to get new clients or bring in more money. Uh, most business owners spend their day literally trying to get more business, more clients, and all you're doing is you're loading up your shovel and you're throwing a bigger amount over your shoulder. We're going to talk today about focusing on your bottom line, the net. If you can raise your net, it's literally free cash flow. It's money that you've already earned, but let's say your net is right now 30 cents on the dollar. If you can raise that by 10 or 20 percent, maybe even 30 percent, you're going to be bringing home 40 or 50 cents. So you don't have to go work harder to bring in a new client. And there are a few things more expensive than generating new clients. I'm going to focus on the net. It is less work, cost, time, and stress to increase your bottom line instead of working on your top line. And again, most business owners focus only on their top line. If someone says grow your business, they're thinking about the top line. And again, that is the hardest thing to do, is to grow your top line. New clients, more business, and invariably you just end up working harder. And it makes no sense if all you're doing is, again, throwing that money over your shoulder. The business owners that I work with usually can raise their net 10 to 30 percent. If you think about that, raising your net 10 to 30 percent, that's money you've already earned and already paid taxes on, so that's a clean net. If you do that cumulatively every year, year in and year out, the rest of your time in business, that is a huge difference in the actual cash you have in your business. And the hardest thing to get out of any business is cash. Okay. Question, sir? Yes. That's sure. That's allowed during the course? I'm sorry? That's allowed during the course? Oh, yeah, it's a nice... If folks used to think that if I'm going to increase my net by 30, 40, that means I definitely have to increase my sales or cut my expenses by 30, 40%. But I'm sure with you, that is not the case, correct? That's right, because the net is the money you've already grossed, you've already paid all of your expenses and you've already paid all of your taxes. So it's literally the cash you're pulling out of your business. At the end of the day, that's what you're in business for, is to pull cash out of the business or to have more cash to reinvest. So if you've got more net, you've actually got money that you can either put back into the business or literally bring home. Okay. Take home cash. Because again, that's what most business owners try and get out of their business, right, is cash. Okay. You're going to have less stress. Most of the business owners that I meet are so busy every day running around making money, go, 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 that you're literally running with your head down. And I'll talk with business owners who do not know their own numbers, which if you think about it, it's amazing. They know the dollar that came in and then they don't know where that dollar went. And it kind of defeats the purpose if you're making a dollar. It's coming in the front door and it's going out the back door. I've always believed 
that the phrase is true, you can work less and achieve more, you just know how to do it. It's a formula. Large changes in your business do not come from big one thing fixes everything. It's small incremental changes. If you can reduce a bill, every bill in your business by five or ten percent across the board, cumulatively that's how you're going to get to increasing your net ten to thirty percent. Think of that. If you grew your business ten to thirty percent every year, that's what you're in business for, is trying to grow your net. Okay. Again, I keep stressing this is about not earning a new dollar. It's about the dollar you've already earned. Where does it go? And this is a, a, a phrase from business school, free cash flow. Free cash flow is literally just that. It's the money at the end of the day that is yours. Every bill has been paid, including your tax bill. We're going to get your free cash flow up. It also means your business will be more valuable upon sale. Because a lot of businesses, if I was going to go buy a business and you talk to a business broker, they're not looking at the top line. They're looking at the bottom line. There's no sense having a business that generates a large gross if at the end of the day the net is only two or three cents on the dollar. Four hours. I'm going to try and get 33 years of knowledge into your head in 240 minutes. But you can run your business like a Swiss watch and most business owners I meet do not. They're literally so busy making money they have no time to manage it. The old phrase in my business is you're so busy being poor you have no time to get rich. And a lot of business owners if you don't manage your money properly you're really just running hard to stay in place. You're working like a dog every year but you're not going anywhere. Cash. The name of this course is getting cash out of your business. And if you're trying to sell a business and I was going to be buying your business, the thing that I'm looking at the most is your net, not your gross. I have a philosophy that I ask a business owner really what is the point to all this? And one of the things we're going to talk about in this course is what are you working for? If you take a look here, this literally is about the proverbial work smarter, not harder. And business owners talk about it, but they don't practice it. They really don't. And Dick, you work at the Small Business Development Center. You see it every day. Yes, sir, I do. Yeah. Everybody's working on their business, not in the business. Right, working on the business, not in the business. Okay. We're also going to talk about, at the end of this course, exit strategies. It might be early for you. You just got in. But if you think about it, two more years. <laughs> That's your strategy. Yeah. If you ask most, and I keep saying most business owners, but it's true, they really don't know where the finish line is. We do. Good for you. But how to get there is the trouble. There you are, right across the valley. Okay. We're gonna. I'm Scottish. We're frugal. We're gonna squeeze every penny out of your business. I know in my business where every penny goes. And people make fun of that, but if you think about it, what's the point of wasting money? Working that hard to literally not know the difference between your top line and your bottom line. I keep coming back to this, what's the point? What are you working this hard for? And most business owners do not have an exit strategy. They have no succession plan. There's a difference between an exit strategy and a succession plan. An exit strategy is literally about trying to sell your business, which is very hard to do. But I'll buy your business if I know that there's a net cash flow. Conversely, a succession plan is usually about trying to pass a business on to somebody in your family. So exit is getting out, I sold it, and a succession plan is I want my children to inherit the business or some family member usually. We're gonna talk about things that business owners don't think about a lot. Most business owners focus their entire day on growing the top line. And that's like looking at one spoke in the wheel. We're going to talk about getting business credit out of your name. Business owners will have virtually everything in their business under their own personal social security or all their credit lines are under their own social security. 
and you've automatically started to break some of the golden rules on asset protection. You brought your personal and your business life into the same orbit. So if you get sued, everything goes into court. We're going to talk about asset protection. Asset protection really is about preventing lawsuits, not getting sued in the first place. How you can structure your finances so that if I'm the opposing counsel and I go do an asset search, which is the first thing an opposing counsel will do, is an asset search. If they see that you're set up where it's very difficult to sue you, you won't get sued in the first place. Succession planning, it's breathtaking to me that most business owners don't even have a simple will. You'll have minor children and you don't have a simple will, which means that the state of Florida is going to name the guardian for your children. And I've always been a big believer that money stress is one of the great stressors in life. About half of divorces come from money stress. Most arguments come from money. And it really is true. The smart money works less and achieves more. If you ever taken a look at some of the most successful people, they're on vacation, they do church, charity, family. I have a client who goes away every quarter and, and you think to yourself, well, how do you do it? They're actually working smarter, not harder. And there's something about the American culture that the more hours you work, the more successful you be. Uh, I'm 56, I've been in business 33 years. When I was up, I worked from New York to Boston. Uh, there was always this badge of honor that if you worked like 100 hours that week. No, I worked 110. Oh, I haven't, I haven't been home in a week. The number of hours that you work is the wrong measure of success. Ideally, you'd like to be working less. If you think about it, it's not the person who worked 100 hours this week, it's the person who maybe worked 20 or 30. That's the person who's got it down. Okay, well, I wanna go back there for a second. We're gonna talk about the largest single bill in your life, income taxes. I'll meet business owners who do not know their own tax bracket. The largest single bill in your life, if you take a look at virtually everything you do, is all about income taxes. It's the forever bill. It comprises roughly 20, 30, 40% of everything you do every day. If you're gonna spend a large part of your life at work, in your business, then be a lifetime learner. And again, I understand that business owners are very busy every day, but if all you're doing is working with your left hand and you're not paying attention to your business and your right hand, it's going to come in the front door and go out the back door. Uh, I know people who don't even open their own statements, who couldn't tell you what they own. They would say, well, my IRA is invested in or my 401k is invested in, and you'll get, and they cannot tell you what they literally own. So you're working hard every day, 10, 15, 20 hours, and you don't know where your money is. Managing money is actually easier than making it is the why of this course. Okay, I'm gonna skip through some of this quickly here because you've got this and this is more so about why we're here. Do you know the top line numbers in your business? You know the, what's coming in? Okay, some business owners don't even know their own income. Every time I come home, she grabs the money and counts the money. My mom was a better money manager than my dad. <laughs> but you got a good team. Yeah. We're going to talk tonight about income taxes and how to pay the right amount. Most Americans overpay their income taxes. I mean, income taxes are a bad enough idea in the first place. Overpaying them is just a colossal waste of money. You would not overpay any other bill in your life. But people overpay their income taxes. People don't even really question. Someone just says, here's your tax bill, and they stroke a check, and they don't really verify, is that even the right number? There's an old phrase from lawyers. If it ain't in writing, it ain't so. So a business owner will say, well, I'm going to pass the business on to my wife and children. And if that's not in writing, that may not actually happen. The day you get sued will be one of the worst days of your life. And if you're successful in America, 
there's a very high probability you're going to get sued. It's a very litigious society. We're going to talk about asset protection because the day you're sued, you cannot transfer assets. It's what's called fraudulent conveyance. So if the sheriff knocks on your door and serves you with papers, at that moment, you can't say, well, I've got to get the house out of my name and change the bank accounts. No, it's frozen in time. And most business owners, everything they own, personal and business, is in their own name. And people say, well, I've got a limited liability company, an LLC. An LLC is a pass-through. It's your own social security number. So for all intents and purposes, if you're the sole managing member of your LLC, that offers you really very little protection in a real bona fide lawsuit. An LLC is primarily meant for how to run your business properly. But if you get sued, it's not very difficult for someone to what's called pierce the corporate veil in your limited liability company. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Peggy. Well, we have an LLC, but it is, we do have an EIN, so. For? For a while, just for taxes and so forth. Is your LLC under your own social security number? No. It has its own federal ID. Right, but who are the managing members of the LLC? You. Right, so at the end of the day, what will happen is it comes through to your 1040 tax return, which is what I meant by your social. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, got its, it's, it's an entity, but it ends up flowing through to your own personal social security number. And most business owners don't run their LLC properly. So again, if I'm the opposing counsel and I'm looking at someone's LLC or I'm looking at how I'm going to find a way to what's called pierce the corporate veil, if I find one instance where you've used your company credit card to buy groceries, then it's not difficult to go to court and convince the judge that this is not really being run as a business. But you're the sole managing members of your LLC, right? So for all intents and purposes, your LLC is you. Okay, I'm a big believer that, that people really could retire early and comfortably. If you take a look at most Americans, they're going to work until they die. It, it kind of breaks my heart. You'll go to some store late at night, like a Walmart, and you'll see people who are 75, 80 years old working there at bad hours, bad pay. And I don't think they're there because they want to be. They're there because a large part of America is going to work until they die. And that's part of this course. Again, everybody thinks that you got to work 100 hours a week and you got to work forever, and that's just really backwards thinking. I've, I say on my radio show that there's more to life than just making money. Okay. I'm going to show you how to work less, achieve more, have an exit strategy, and it really will change your life, how you run your business the rest of your life. Left hand, right hand. Making money, managing money. Okay. You all set? All right, that's kind of the preface to why we're here. Let's get into it. The first place that I help my clients get organized is virtually nobody that I meet has a budget, has a system. And I know budget has a bad connotation. People think it means scrimping and saving and sacrificing and doing without. Nonsense. People who have a budget actually have more cash because they know where it's going. Everything in life runs on a system, but time and money, people manage very badly. So the first place that I work with clients is get your money in a system. And it's amazing to me again, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm lecturing, but it's amazing to me that people do not track their own money. They have no idea when it comes in the door where it goes. And time. If you ever had a day where you're crazy busy running and it's very hectic, and you say to yourself at the end of the day, what did I get done? There's a big difference between being busy and being effective. So, this actually took me a lot of time. This is free online software that you can use to track your money. There are apps that you can download to your phone. You could go to any one of these and it will show you how to put your money into a system. 
Now, all of these are free. Some of them have upgrades where maybe it might cost five or ten dollars. I don't think there's anything in there that costs more than ten dollars a month. But I would suggest to anybody, go to any one of these different sites. And this one, that's a bit.ly link. This one will give you a lot of different choices. So I think there's about five or six more in this link alone. But I would find one that you like, that you're comfortable with, and that works well for you, and I would get your money in the system. If you don't, I just don't know how people are tracking it. I really don't. It, it's kind of like taking a long trip without a map. This is about time management. I was reading some articles recently on how multitasking really doesn't work. People say, well, I'm picking up my phone and I'm, I'm texting and I'm returning emails and it just doesn't work. The human brain doesn't work well that way. Ideally, what you want to do is one task at a time. So even, and, and it's hard to do. It, it's hard to just say, I'm only going to do this right now. But there's certain spots in my day now where I'll say, this is for making phone calls. And I'm not going to pay attention to emails or texts. And then there are times where you say, no, this is for taking care of my emails and I'm going to let the phone ring through. And all of us have been trained, especially I would say maybe the last 20 years or so, where we're supposed to multitask. Human brain doesn't work well. There's a lot of research that shows that you end up doing a lot of things very poorly versus just focusing. And you see it with texting and driving. I mean, take your pick. You're not going to do both well. These are free online apps for time management. Because that's where you lose most of your day, is time. And the older I get, the more I realize that my most valuable asset is time. It really is. It just kind of slips away on you. When you're young, you want to, oh, I wish I could get older. And then the older you get, you say to yourself, holy smokes, where'd my day go? And I've had myself, this is a learned skill to, to really segment your day. To say, this is when I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. But if you've ever been on the phone, you'll see an email come in if you're at your desk, and you'll start to do the email while you're on the phone. And then all of a sudden, everything just kind of goes south. Pick one task and focus on it. And a lot of these, rescue time, all of these are really easy pieces of software, and they will get you into a system. OK. Wow, I'm a big believer in getting out of debt. It's very hard to really get ahead if you carry debt. And I'm not just talking personal debt, credit card and mortgage. Most business owners carry a significant amount of debt. And while the interest is tax deductible on your debt in business, it's just you've got the eighth wonder of the world working against you. Compound interest. I use a lot of Dave Ramsey's concepts to power down your debt. Do you folks carry debt now in your business? Yeah. Okay. Are you familiar with Dave Ramsey's concepts of powering down debt? We're going to get into that in just a second. But when somebody sits down with me, the first thing I say to them is, we've got to get your time and your money into a system. Second thing is to get you out of debt. I understand that business owners at some point in time carry debt because it, it finances growth. That's fine. It takes money to make money, but you want to get out of debt as fast as possible. You really do because most debt these days is double digit interest. So it's, it's very hard to get ahead. It's like I say, it's like having Superman as your nemesis every day. You wake up and you open up the front door and there's Superman who gives you a sock debt service in America comprises about 35% of most people's disposable income. Think about that. You're in a dollar, and before you do anything, even pay your taxes, you're at 65 cents. You then pay your taxes at 20, 30, 40%, and you're down to about a quarter, and you haven't paid payroll, your phone, your other expenses, virtually nothing. And then people wonder why when you funnel down a dollar of gross, you're down to sometimes two or three cents on the dollar. It's why there's virtually no savings rate going on in America today. A lot of it has to do with the fact that debt is soaking up about 35 cents of almost everybody's dollar. 
Okay, you said you were not familiar with Dave Ramsey's concepts of powering down debt. All right, let me go to this side. It's a little bit easier. Okay. All right. This is just an example. And I did this recently for a client trying to get out of student debt. If you were going to pay off debt and you had different bills, different credit cards or whatever kind of debt, which would you tackle first? Chris, which would you go after first? The one with the highest interest rate. Right. Dick, what would you go after first? I'd try never to get debt. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> You'd go after the one with the highest interest rate, right? It's actually not how it works. You go after the bill you can get rid of first and fastest. If you'll notice, take a look at the rates on these. There's the interest rate, right? But take a look at the principal balance. We're going after the bill that has the smallest principal balance first. So here's how this works. The power payment, I don't want to get in the way of the slide. The description on the far left is the kind of debt. Then there's a principal balance. There's a monthly payment that the person is already making. So in this example, the person is paying $43 a month to the student loan number four. Student loan number two is $50. Those are the payments this person is already making. So they're spending $1,577 a month on principal and interest on their current debt. Everybody with me? Okay. When we did the budget, the software, and again, I don't like to use that term budget. I'm going to call it a money tracker because budget has this connotation that you can't have any fun. But in actuality, if you track your money, you're going to have more cash and you're going to have more fun. We found $750 in this person's budget that was really just kind of trickling through their fingers. And these days with ATM machines, and it's so easy to lose track of cash. I try not to use cash too much because it just goes. You go out on a Friday night and you go to the ATM and you think to yourself, I don't even know where the money went the next morning. The power payment in this example was what we found when we did their budget. And remember again, the budget is job one. It really is the foundation. I don't know how anybody, any business owner, any planner could really properly do anything unless you knew where your cash was, in and out. So I got to tell you, this person had a bit of an aha moment when they found $750 in their budget. Because when I first met this young man, he's like, I, I'm, you know, I'm barely getting ahead and I have no money for this and no money for that. And by the time we took him through the money tracker, some of that free software, there was actually $750. Now that's what's called the power payment here. And this is really Dave Ramsey's system of powering down debt. Uh, power down or you'll hear the snowball effect. So here's how it works. We're going to take the $750. Now this person has this money. I didn't ask him to come up with new money or find money or cut back on spending. It literally was already in his budget. He just didn't know it. Take the $750 and you add that to the $43, and how long will it take us to pay off student loan for? Anybody? It takes four payments. We went after the smallest bill first. So once we finished paying off four payments on student loan four, what's left over, Dick? Now they're not paying the $43, right? right. They've still got the $750 each month, but you just paid off the first loan, so there's no more $43 anymore. What do you do with it? You take 43 and 750, and now you've got 793. 793, we're going to attack student loan number two. 793, I am going to get in the way of my own slide. 793 now was this 750 plus the 43. That bill got paid off after four payments. Now we're going to go after student loan two. We've got 750 and 43. I've got 793. And remember, he was already paying 50. Everybody with me? Okay. So 793 and 50. 
How long does it take us to pay off student loan two? Seven. Right. So we've knocked off the bills not by their rate, but by their size. So 793 and 50 would go to this. I took 750 plus the 43 that's no longer needed because that bill is paid. That's 793. 50 was what this man was already paying on student loan two. 793 and 50 pays off student loan two in seven months. Then what happens? Sunday? You tell me how the math works now. So how do we get to 843? It'll be 793 plus 53. 793 plus the 50 that he doesn't need to spend this 50 on this bill because it just got paid off. So now he has a power point of 843. So we got 750. 43 is no longer needed. Student loan 4 is paid. 793 on top of the regular payment of 50 knocks off this bill in seven months. Now you've got 793 and 50. You got 843. And what's this man paying on student loan one, Cindy? Three, uh, three thousand total, three thousand He's paying 55. 55. 843 plus 55 pays off student loan one in 10 months. So 843 plus 55 becomes, Dick? 898. 898. We got to 898. By the time you're at 898, those first three bills are paid. They're zero, right? 898 plus 95. And you get to knocking off the Pepperdine loan in 13. If you keep taking the power payment of 750, plus the payments you no longer have, plus the payment you're accustomed to making, mm -hmm. you keep coming here and you keep knocking these down until you get to a spot where you've got 1,064 in this example and the mortgage is 1,060. You're basically doubling down on your mortgage. Now when I met this man, if I told him that without changing a penny in your budget, without saying stop doing this or stop going out to dinner or just reshuffling the deck, so to speak. You could be doubling down in your mortgage. How long did it take him to get to doubling down in his mortgage? It took him only two years. Imagine saying to the average person, I'm going to show you how, and the numbers aren't always linear, but I'm going to show you how to basically double down on your mortgage in two years with no changes to what you're already doing. They'd say, I don't believe you. But again, it started with step one get your money in the system. He didn't believe he had 750. I'm not sure he still believes it sometimes. We double down on the mortgage. 1,064 plus 203. Within 22 months, you're more than doubling your mortgage. The mortgage payment is 1,060. He's adding $1,267 on top of 1,060. Now debt works both ways. Debt is not linear. Compound interest is exponential. It does this. In reverse, it does that. It goes away very quickly or it goes up very quickly, right? Take a look. 1,267 on top of 1,060. This mortgage is done in 86 months. This man if he did his current payments, if he didn't do anything differently than what he was doing when I met him, he'd be out of debt in 15 years. His current debt was 175480 His total payments, though, were how much? Pretend that this is where I met you, and you're right here. Had $175,000 of debt, which is what? It's all those bills, right? But $175,000 of debt isn't $175,000. By the time you pay it off in 15 years, it's $221,000, which is interest ugh, of $45,000. Now, interest for a business owner on a business note is tax deductible, but it's still interest.
So even if you're in a 30% bracket, the government's only picking up 30% of the interest. So every dollar is still 70 cents yours. If this man had continued doing what he was doing when I met him, he'd be out of debt in 15 years. And he would pay $45,000 of interest. And at the end of 15 years, his savings balance would be zero. Right, because he was just doing what we all do. You pay the interest, you pay the debt, you end up finishing the debt, and 15 years later, you've got zero in savings, and you're 15 years older, and time doesn't come back. People think you have to save a lot of money. Now, I was working the other day with the police and the firefighters. It's not how much you save. It's when you start and the frequency, the consistency. Some of these firefighters are saving $10 a week. You work with them when they're 20, and you work with them when they're 50, and you see these accounts that are absolutely amazing, and it was because they just did the frequency. It's why 401ks work so well, the payroll deducted. Okay, if you take a look at the power down here, what we just did was we reduced this person's debt from 15 years to seven, okay? Same amount of debt, $175,000 a principal. How did you get that? Cindy, how'd you get $175,000 for All the money he owed. That's right. Initially. Right. These added up to this. So if he had wanted to get out of debt that day, he would have had to stroke a check for one seventy-five. Mm -hmm. So in both examples, it's still $175,000 of debt. He pays 221,200 total, or 45,000 in interest, doing what he's currently doing. Doing what most people do, making those minimum payments, and not doing a budget and not finding 750. He could not tell me, even after we did this exercise, and he started to save the 750, even after we did the budget, he still couldn't tell me. He said, I don't know where it was going. I still can't believe I'm doing 750, and he's doing this to this day. It's going on about a year now. A young man, too. And he called me because from my radio show, he really wanted to get out of debt. So, if you follow this all the way through, and you're done in seven years, not 15, the total payments will be 198. So he paid how much less in interest? 45 versus 23, right? Okay, first of all, imagine getting rid of debt in seven years versus 15. You know, if you really want a good night's sleep, get out of debt, right? Watch what happens here. When this man is done in seven years, right? What's the difference between where he would have been and where he is now? How many years, please? 15.1 years versus 7.17, he's got what? 7.93 years that he's not paying the interest. Everybody with me? Okay. Well, how much was he paying when I met him? 1,577, right? Then we got his money in the system and we found him 750. 750 plus 1,577 equals, so stop and think about it. At the end of seven years, he wakes up one day and he says, now I'm supposed to go pay, oh my gosh, I'm out of debt. I have no bills to pay, no debt to pay. But he's still got the 750 and he's still got this, right? So what does he do with 2327? Exactly, he buys a new car <laughs> or two. <laughs> what he does in this example, and he's not there yet, but he will be. You wake up one day and you're all set to pay. Oh my gosh, I have no debt. But I've got the 750 and I've got the 1577. Assuming that somebody doesn't just go off the rails if you take $2,327, which again is $1,577 plus the 750, 
We saved him eight years, 7.93. Well, if you now take 2003-27 for eight years at 4%, you've now got over $200,000 of savings. If we go back, if he just kept on doing what he's doing, at the end of 15 years, Cindy, what would his savings be? Goose eggs. At the end of 15 years, not changing one thing in his life. I didn't say, don't go buy this for 750, or you can't take vacations, or you and the kids can't go to Disney World, or stop going out, none of that. It, it's like cards. I'm not a very good card player, but every once in a while I'll play cards with my dad who lives with me, and I'll be like, ah, oh, I got nothing. And they'll be like, let me see your hand here. And I'll be like, oh, yes. Look at that. You got, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I, I, I didn't know I had a straight flush. If you simply reshuffle your finances into a system, I keep coming back to a system. Nature is a system. This man is going to have this versus that. And I didn't have him change one thing, except get some free online software, stick to it, and then you put your money and your debt payments into a system. This is another system. If you're an accountant, then you understand it's all about systems, right? 260,000 versus zero is the end result. If you take a look, on the left, he would have paid off his debt in 15 years, and he paid it off in roughly a little over seven. Essentially, we cut his timeline in half. And we turned his savings from what would have been a zero into, again, that's a big number. By the way, in 15 years, this man will not even be 50. So I simply used an example of keeping the math simple. The eight year difference between where he would have been at 15 year mortgage and we now, he's got $260,000. Life doesn't stop there. He's got 260,000, he's not even 50. If you do the math out to retirement, this number gets pretty silly. Or it would have been a zero and he would have started saving 15 years later from zero. Questions? You can get lost in this math. Any questions at all? Anybody? Okay. Explained very well. Thank you. It's you know, the first time I looked at it, I'm in the business. Yeah. When I went to one of these courses, I'm like, all right, hang on. Back up, please. It's why I take the time. Because you can get math is very clean once you get it, but you can get off in the weeds on this. You really can. By the way. I ran him numbers. I used 4%, by the way, which is not hard to get in the marketplace today. Now, everybody thinks that zero is the only rate you can get. That's not true. He's in a guaranteed account. He's not speculating. He's in a guaranteed account. I used 4%. Didn't use 14. Don't blue sky people. In 15 years, this man will not even be 50. If you extrapolate this number out over his life expectancy, at 4%, it becomes seven figures. The swing that debt will do. So I know business owners say, and I've been there too, and you were there, you borrowed? Half a million dollars. Sometimes you need to do what you need to do to get, you know, you gotta buy the seed corn to plant the corn. But debt out of debt, it is one of the great banes of Americans. And you'll meet business owners and people who say, well, my, debts, my interest is tax deductible. We're going to get into why, again, at a 30% bracket, you're only getting 30 cents picked up. Okay, let's march on. Boy, this is one of my favorite topics, income tax reduction. I'd like to go back in history and find the person who first uttered the word, I got an idea, well, why don't we tax them? But it's the law. And I'm a legal beagle, I go right down the middle, I'm an arrow, I always have been. But I tell clients, don't underpay your taxes, don't overpay. You can use a very simple analogy of drive 55, you go down the highway, it says 55, 
and somebody goes by you, and by the way, I drive 55. I have clients all the way up and down Florida. I put it on cruise control, and I see somebody going by me at 95 miles an hour. In this example of income tax reduction, that's called felony tax fraud. It's willful, intentional violating of the law, and that's going to end badly. You go down the road and you see that person in an accident or a ticket. But conversely, you're driving 55, and by the way, when I'm, 50, when I'm driving 55, I don't need a radar detector, I don't worry about the police and the bushes. I'm driving 55, I got nothing to worry about. I've been audited enough times in my life where I'm like, yeah, come on by. Matter of fact, a good audit from the IRS will help you tune up your books. Yeah, come on by, we'll get a pot of coffee and we'll look at the books. So I never worry about audits. You drive 55. But you also notice when you're driving 55, you ever go by the person driving 40? And they're clutching the wheel. They're afraid to take advantage of what's in the IRS code because somehow they'll get audited. Well, if you do what's in the IRS code, even if you're audited, it's right there in the code. So to me, it's black and white. It's either in the IRS code or it isn't in the IRS code. I get a kick out of it. People will say to me sometimes when I talk about income tax reduction, they'll say, is it legal? And I'll be like, oh, come on. Is, it is there any other way? Most business owners do not avail themselves of Schedule C, which is profit or loss from business or profession, which is where most of your deductions come from, is Schedule C. You folks are filing a Schedule C? Okay. Most business owners do not properly maximize everything on a Schedule C. You know what a Schedule C is? When you file your 1040 tax return, but let's assume it's an individual, 1040, the schedules are the things you add. So Schedule A is itemized deductions, charitable medical expenses. Schedule B is interest income. So your bank certificate paid you, whatever. You gotta put that down. Schedule C, which is one page, at the top it says profit or loss from business or profession. And it's all of the deductions allowed to a business owner. Most business owners don't go a step further and take a hard look and by the way, excuse me, IRC stands for Internal Revenue Code. IRC. Sorry, it's shop talk. IRC 162 and IRC 79 are chock full of black and white deductions, and some of them very substantial that most business owners do not even know exist. Most business owners do not know that health insurance is tax deductible. It's amazing what business owners don't utilize in the IRS code. So I've always been amazed at people who cheat on their taxes because there's so many things you can do legally. Taxes to me are what I call the forever bill. Think about this. You get up every day and you go to work and you work 10, 15, 20 hours, 8 hours a day and every second of that you're spending anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of your day paying the tax man. Top federal tax rate, to, eh, federal tax rate today is 39.6. Most people don't slip below about 20 percent. If you're below 20 percent tax bracket, you're, you're probably not really worried about paying taxes. You're worried about just eating. But the average American, the middle class, is somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of everything you do every day to the day you die. In retirement, virtually every spigot you open up is gonna be taxable. Your IRA, your 401k, Social Security is taxable. I rarely meet people who retire and then get poor overnight and their bracket plunges. So there's a myth that people say, well, when I retire, I'll go from this bracket to this bracket. Probably not. As a matter of fact, your bracket may go up because all of the investments your IRA, your 401k, your Social Security, you're going to turn those spigots on and it'll be taxable income. So in retirement, you almost always see successful people, pretty much their bracket stays the same. So if you're at, let's say, a 30% tax bracket, let's use that for example tonight, 30%, you're probably going to be at 30% right through the rest of your life. And if you want to know how prevalent taxes are, you pay one final income tax return after you're dead which kind of says it all. Yeah, when you leave this earth, someone's gonna file, you, you pass away in July, 
that's a tax year. Someone's going to be filing a tax return for you the following April and you've been dead eight or nine months. Kind of says it all about taxes being the forever bill. Two things. Taxes are a variable expense. They're not a fixed expense. You understand this as an accountant. Fixed expenses are what? Something that's the same bill every month. Your, your rent, your office rent, whatever it might be. But taxes are a variable expense. So I'm always amazed when a business owner just strokes a check and pays that bill without massaging that bill properly and questioning that bill. I tell people, find out what your exact tax bracket is. There's no other bill in your life you would overpay. If your electric bill came in at $100, you wouldn't send them $110. And if it came in one month at $110 and you were used to $100, what would you do? Probably you drop everything and pick up the phone, right? You ever get a MasterCard bill or a Visa bill and there's a charge that's not yours? for $9 or 19, whatever it is, and you stop everything and you call up the bank immediately and say, that's not my bill, that's not my charge. <laughs> but then somebody says to you every April, yeah, you need to write a check for $40,000. Oh, okay. okay. Get proactive about your taxes. I meet many business owners who say, oh, my accountant handles that all. That's how you see people get, literally, ripped off. You see it in Hollywood all the time. People say, well, I, I got ripped off by my manager. It's because you abdicated versus delegated. There's a difference. I'll meet very successful business owners, usually the doctors in particular, who say, ah, so-and-so handles that. And that's a recipe for something bad happening. I have a big thing about what I call working in the present. What's that? Bill? No, I see some scribbling here, and I asked her why, you know, I've never seen her scribble. So I, I just learned something, and she thought it wasn't her. What did it mean? Oh. <laughs> was it? I thought it was Brian. It wasn't mine either. <laughs> All right, let me get back to my coffee here. <laughs> Sorry. If you're the quarterback of your team, you need to show up in your own huddle. We can't run plays without you. So if you're my client, every quarter, we're going to sit down, probably over a good meal, and we're going to get your attorney, preferably a tax attorney, if you don't have one. Tax attorneys will save you more than they cost you. And tax attorneys complement a CPA. They're not redundant tasks. They're different skill sets. Tax attorney, your advisor, your CPA, and you sit down quarterly over a good meal, and you work in the present. Stop and think about it. This April of 2015, People are going to get together with their accountant and talk about what tax year. It's April of 2015. They're all going to get together and talk about their 2014 taxes, which they can do zero about, except moan about it. Oh my gosh, that's a huge tax bill. It's, you're literally waiting for a train that left. And most people will file their taxes when? The average, the average wage earner in this country will file in February or March or April by April 15th because they're going to get a refund. You talk to probably 95% of business owners and when do they file their taxes? Before midnight on the 15th. Of October. No, October. They take extensions all the way out to. So I'll give you an example of a client I worked with last year. Gets a hold of me and he files his taxes for 2013 in October of 14. So right off the bat, you're basically working 10 months late. If the year ended in December 31st and you're filing your taxes October 15th, you're 10 months behind the curve and you're filing taxes that you can do nothing about. It's too late. Work in the present. In a perfect world, if money's in a system, we're all the way back to original your budget, it's really not hard to put your flash drive into your PC, 
take out your numbers for the first quarter of 2015 this year go to dinner with your advisor your account your tax attorney it's now March 31st of 2015 you brought your flash drive it was very simple you didn't have to bring a bag full of receipts you just pulled it out of your free online software for your budget you showed up for a nice dinner and in March 31st, April 1st of 2015, what year are we working on? 15. Okay. Right now, in January, no, it's February already. It's February of 2015. And you've got your money in your business in a system where you don't have receipts all over the place or I don't know where things are. You put a few receipts each night. I had about two or three receipts last night. Who has more than two or three receipts a day? How many lunches did you eat? Right? How much did you buy that day? I bought five tractors. No, you bought one tractor. You put your receipts in about two minutes before you go to bed that night into the different category of your online software and you're done. Now it's April 1st or March 31st of 2015. And it's time to get together with your, what I call your fat team. Dick, the fat team is what? It's the financial advisory team. Of course it is. It's my fat team. It's my quarterly meeting. How many advisors, by the way, especially investment advisors, in my industry, call you up quarterly and say it's time to get together? Almost nobody. I don't know who I fault more. The advisor for not being proactive or the client for not demanding more. Shame on everybody. Okay, so it's April 1st. We're gonna get together for a good dinner. We're gonna have a nice time. These are people you know and trust and like and respect and work with, so it's a nice time. And over dinner, your advisor or two, your account, and I know people have more than one. There's different kinds of accounts, right? There's forensic, there's... If you run a certain kind of business, you may have more than one accountant and your attorney. Now, maybe it's not just your general attorney, but definitely get somebody at the table with an LLM after their name, a master's in taxation. I've worked with people who have master's in taxation. They're just brilliant. All they do all day is read the IRS code. And by the way, it's not, yeah, they curl up at night with a bottle of Merlot and they say, ah, I'm gonna read a tax court case tonight. I can't wait. By the way, tax attorneys, and I say this respectfully to CPAs. Tax attorneys are much more proactive about the current law. Most CPAs are sole practitioners, or if you take a look at most CPA firms, there are one or two CPAs who got together because they're cost sharing. Most CPAs have about two to 300 clients. Unless you've got a big company and a big CPA firm, your CPA is probably a one or two person shop. See, I was PC there. I didn't say one-man shop. I said a one- or two-person shop. What do you think the average CPA spends their day doing? Chris, what do you think the average CPA spends their day doing? Filling out forms. That's their job. This form, that form, this form, that form. And not everything is just April 15th. They're, they're filling out forms for people all throughout the year. It leaves them virtually no time. Think about this. You're, you've got two to 300 clients. You're on the phone. You're filling out forms. You're doing math. You're doing calculations. It leaves the CPA virtually no time to stay on top of court cases, revenue rulings, IRS notices, and what's called PLRs, private letter rulings. They're not right there saying, oh my gosh, look at this court case. I'll give an example. Remember I told you the client who came to me after they'd filed their taxes this October? And this man was sick of thinking that something's wrong. He finally had had enough where he said, I'm tired of filing late and I'm tired of filing rushed. And my wife gets mad at me because we're always slapping stuff together and throwing it, running down to throw a check in the mail. And I don't even think it's right. And he said, I want a second opinion on my taxes. So from... October through December of this past year, we began to lift up the hood, and I can't tell you the errors we found. 
He was also currently at the time on the advice of his CPA overfunding his Roth. He was putting more into Roth allowed by law. It was incomprehensible with a 6% penalty. It was just, it was almost a bad joke. Who gave you this advice? A second opinion. But my point with it all was that at one point in time towards the end of the year, this is now 2014, we were trying to look back and see if we could amend his tax returns. You can go back how many years, Dick? I think uh, two or three, maybe, or three. From date of filing. Right. Not the date it was due, the date of filing. You can go back three years and do a 1040X and amend your tax return. So he said, I want a second opinion. I want to look back. I want to see if there's been mistakes. And then I want to look forward into 2015 and see what I can do differently to maximize my deductions. I don't think I'm maximizing all of my deductions. I think I'm missing stuff. He just felt in his gut that this isn't right, and I hate being rushed every October 15th. My point is that along the way I said to him, here are all the deductions available to you in the code that you're not currently utilizing. And one of them was health insurance for his employees. Everybody with me? Because health insurance, group health, is regarded as basically wages. You know this. So if you have a group health plan for your employees and you're paying for Cindy's health insurance, that's a deduction. Clean as a whistle. It's been the code forever. Do you know when group health started, by the way? During World War II. Do you know why group health was instituted for American corporations during World War II and allowed to be a deduction by Congress for the employer? I was a history major, and I still am. I love history. I love reading. During World War II, there were wage and price controls. We're fighting a war. You're a corporate executive. You're not getting a raise while our boys are dying. Nobody got any raises during World War II. So corporate America said, well, I'm working hard too. I don't get a raise for four years and I'm running a big corporation. Group health was instituted to allow corporations to not only take care of their employees, but it was essentially a back door to giving the business owner a raise. I didn't raise your salary, but I reduced your taxable income. You run a business. No, no pay raise for you during the World War II. But here's what I'll do. If you buy health insurance for your employees called group health, which at the time was what? Group health. Oh, okay. So I take care of my employees, I buy group health, and I get a deduction. Fantastic. Group health has been tax deductible in the code since World War II. Still is. Yes, sir. The military always had group life insurance. It was called SGLI, Soldiers Group Life Insurance. And that was basically a way for you to save taken out of your monthly pay, and yet you were buying some life insurance, which was not taxable at the time. It, it allowed the best of both worlds. The employees got taken care of. There was no group health prior to World War II. There was no such thing. And it allowed the employer to basically get a raise by reducing their taxable income. Would you mind getting me that bottle of Coke, please? Is that okay? Can you move? Is that all right? My AV guy, Chris? Are we still live? <laughs> Folks, I take your money very seriously. I do not take myself that seriously. Thank you. You can have fun with money. I just try and be real with people. Okay, so here's my point about working in the present and about getting second opinions on your taxes and getting a tax attorney and getting people who focus on your taxes quarterly. In December of 2014, the second opinion CPA I brought in and a tax attorney and I were working with this man looking forward into 2015 to maximize tax deductions. And the man says, well, I heard group health is phasing out and I as an employer could help pay for your individual health insurance. So if I don't want to set up a big expensive group health policy with all of the rules and regulations, and if you set up group health, there's a lot of rules and regulations. You're basically into ERISA pension law and HIPAA, and it's, 
ask anybody who has group health, they get the deduction and they get a lot of headaches too. A lot of paperwork, it's a government program, basically. Anytime you get a deduction from the IRS, you're gonna get a lot of rules and regulations to go with it. So the man says, I've heard that I could go buy individual health insurance for my employees and get the deduction under the new Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. So we did a little digging and the, the whole point of this story is that the IRS issued a notice, which he was unaware of, that said very clearly, if you're an employer and you're thinking of taking a dollar and helping Cindy pay for her individual health insurance, good for you, but it is not tax deductible. And there are people out there today, vendors, who are promoting the idea that an employer can take a dollar, give Cindy some money as an employee, here's a check, you deduct it as wages and she goes and buys individual health insurance. You can give her that check, but it's not deductible. The point of it was that he said, I didn't know that. I heard you could, and we said, here's the IRS notice. And he would have gone down a path of, oops. My point again, get somebody with an LLM after their name, master's in taxation, and tell me a year later if that person has not made you more than they cost you. Okay, work in the present. Sit down quarterly and work on that year's taxes. So at the end of March, if you're doing something that's not working or the laws changed or anything at all, you've got the rest of the year to say, okay, we're gonna leave dinner and the CPA's got their marching orders and the tax attorney's got their homework and the advisor has their homework and the client has their homework and you break out of the huddle and I'll see you again in three months. And you're never behind. When everybody else is racing to the post office to get their postmark, you're like, nah, I found it also dovetails what? Quarterly files nicely and dovetails with your quarterly filings. So when you write your quarterly tax check, guess what? It's a correct number. And there's no stress, and you break from dinner, and I'll see you in three months. And I'll bring my flash drive, which didn't take much work, because I've got my money in the system, and I do it daily, and life has less stress. I'm trying to try all the pieces together here. You're never hurried, you're never rushed, and you're never writing a check saying to yourself, but that's a lot of money, I wonder if that's the right amount. A little bonus here, the six sources of tax-free income in America. Let's have a little fun. What are the six sources of tax-free income in America? Very hard to get tax-free income. Anybody want to take a run at it? Money in the King of Islands. What's that? Municipal bonds. Municipal bonds. Let me stress for a moment why I want to hit tax-free income. Aside from the fact that it's tax-free. This country owes about $20 trillion of debt. Roughly, that's what they say. Well, if the U.S. government says that they owe $20 trillion, I'll bet you it's probably a bit more. <laughs> it's like when they say an aircraft carrier is going to cost a billion. No, it's not. It's going to cost $3 billion. If we owe 20 trillion, and by the way, Congress will admit that, get a load of this, that 20 trillion of debt you hear does not include the obligations to Social Security and Medicare. Those are off books or off balance sheet or off budget as they call it. So we have a few bills in this country. Who's gonna pay those bills? The middle class. The people at the top General Electric paid no taxes last year, zero, because they, they have a team of attorneys, literally probably maybe 50 or 100 attorneys, spending their entire year working on nothing but. And they're doing it legally. So we could have a conversation as to how is that possible, but the top 1% are not gonna be paying a lot of taxes. And by the way, right now, Mr. Obama wants to tax more of the wealthy. If you look at the numbers, of how many truly wealthy one percenters there are in this country, if you tax them to the max, it's gonna be a drop in the bucket. Because there's not a lot of them. So out of a room of 100 people, I'm gonna tax one person from here to Zanzibar. You're still not gonna get a lot of money. 
the people below us for whatever reason are not gonna be paying a lot of taxes maybe they don't have jobs so if you're us the middle class I can tell you what I'm thinking I'm getting ready for higher tax brackets in retirement irrespective of my income I'm 56 if I went fast forward and said oh I'm 76 I'm not working anymore I'm retired and my income hasn't really changed I'm bringing home my IRA and my Social Security and my pension etc etc why am I in a higher tax bracket because they've raised brackets I would say to any client I would really look very hard at tax-free income we're at a 40 percent top federal tax bracket in the United States today 39.6 you know what the top federal tax bracket was under Franklin Roosevelt it's 90 percent plus you know what the top federal tax bracket was under Lyndon Johnson this is only one generation ago Lyndon Johnson top federal tax bracket was 70 percent plus 70 so when somebody says to me today, oh, taxes are outrageous, if I showed you a wall chart historically of U.S. taxes and tax rates, they're very cyclical. We're actually in a trough. So if you think 40% is high in taxes, get ready. And then you take a look at the debt we owe, and you take a look at the demographics in this country. The millennials are the first generation, the 20-somethings, the first American generation ever to be smaller than the preceding generation. So if you just look at the demographics, you say, uh-oh, if we've got at least 20 trillion of debt and 75 million baby boomers are leaving the workforce, heading into retirement, therefore retiring and not earning wages and not paying taxes, the burden of the taxes has to fall upon 20 somethings and that's a smaller group and you say oh no there's a big hole in the middle as to who's gonna pay the taxes and that's called the middle class so there are six sources of tax-free income in the United States it's not in your syllabus so if you want to jot this down municipal bonds municipal bonds are what please I was gonna say fixed annuities municipal tax deferred Right. Tax-free bonds, usually issued by state governments, municipalities, uh, revenue bonds, a toll road. So tax-free municipal bonds, source number one. Source number two, anybody? Roth IRAs. Now you could take a Roth IRA and put it in a fixed annuity and it's going to generate a tax-free income. So a Roth IRA is tax-free. Traditional IRAs will come out taxable. Everybody with me? Traditional IRA, like a 401k or a 403b, these are all IRS code sections. If you work for a hospital or nonprofit, you're not doing a 401k, it's a 403b. If you're a firefighter or a policeman, you're not doing a 401k, it's a 457. If you work for a corporation, it's a 401k. What are these? They're actually IRS code sections. Little 401k is an IRS code section. Bottom line is that all of those plans, the money goes in pre-tax, right? Tax deductible. It grows tax deferred, and it comes out taxable. Ugh. And again, don't expect to be in a lower tax bracket. I've, I can't think of anybody I know who is sailing along, working really well, doing fine, retired, and the next day their bracket did this magically. It's not gonna happen. And if you then factor in the US government passing laws to raise taxes, if you really wanna protect yourself, look at tax-free income. Source number two, a Roth IRA. Anybody know what a Roth conversion is? What's a Roth conversion, please? Somebody's standing on this side of the river with their IRA today, looking towards retirement. And they say, you know, he's got a point about the demographics in this country, the millennials being a smaller group of people to tax, just numbers-wise. Because when I was growing up, 
four, five, six children was not that unusual. Who has four or five children now? People have one or two. And the millennials were the first generation. So if you take a look at the debt we owe and the demographics in this country, you say, uh-oh. By the way, there's a great book called The Demographic Cliff by Harry Dent, D-E-N-T. I would highly urge anybody to read that book because it shows you based on demographics, not politics, not opinion, just based on the number of people you have to tax. The millennials behind us, uh-oh, fewer people in the workforce. Okay. Somebody says, I've got a traditional IRA, and I believe we're going to have higher taxes in this country. I, I believe that from everything we just discussed. What can I do? I'm stuck. I've got an IRA. You can do what's called a Roth conversion. Dick, you know what a Roth conversion is? I've heard so much about it, and I know that I'm too old to qualify for it. Well, you run the numbers. And I don't know that for a fact, but you run the numbers. And basically what somebody says, and there's software that advisors have, I have it, for Roth conversion. You, you put the numbers in, and it will tell you that if you paid this amount of money now, basically bit the bullet and paid the tax today, <coughs> you can get that money tax-free. So even if you're in a traditional IRA or a 401k rollover, you have the ability to take a look with very simple software and generate numbers that will tell you, is a Roth conversion beneficial to me? You can also do a Roth conversion in pieces. Someone says, my IRA is 150,000. If I converted 150,000 and paid the tax in one lump sum, that's, that's a big number. You can do it in pieces. You could do 20% this year and 20 next and 20 next and 20 next and kind of slowly migrate across the river. Okay, Roth is number two source. Number three source of tax-free income? Are savings bonds tax-free? Reverse mortgages. You have to be age 62 or older, you have to own your own home, cannot be a mobile home, and you have all this equity in your home, which is basically your principal. Now, you're a CPA. What happens when somebody... Oh, I thought you were extraordinary. I said she was my bookkeeper. Okay, excuse me. Accountant. Okay. A reverse mortgage allows you to take the principal out of your home. You're basically taking out your own money. Well, return of capital is what? It's not a taxable event. So a reverse mortgage is another way of getting tax-free income. So you have $100,000 of equity in your home. You put that money in. It's your capital. It's no different than selling a stock that you made no money on. You put in $10, you got $10 out. It's not a taxable event. A reverse mortgage will allow you to take a monthly check, and that check is not considered taxable income. It's your own capital coming back to you. There's a lot of myths about reverse mortgages. People say, well, I'm going to be kicked out of my house. Here's what will happen. You're allowed to stay in your house till the day you die. And when you pass away, if you've taken out $50,000 worth of checks, you have a $50,000 debt at the closing. You didn't lose the house. The bank didn't come in and take it. When you leave this earth and you inherit the house, not sure you're going to inherit Dick's house, but when you inherit the house, <laughs> let's say Dick is kind enough to leave you his house. Thanks. <laughs> when you're at the closing, you owe the bank $50,000, and the rest of the house is yours. So when you hear these stories about, oh, they're going to kick Ram out of the house, and they're going to, they're going to take that, not so. You simply have a debt against the house, a lien, if you will. Third source of tax-free income, reverse mortgages. Anybody in retirement? It's something worth looking at, especially if you want extra income. It may not be right, a Roth conversion. You run the numbers. I'm a numbers guy. And these days, there's software for everything. Roth conversions, reverse mortgages. What's the right Social Security benefit for a couple? You just plug the numbers in, and on the other side comes out your answer. And it's black and white. Oh, too late for me in life to do a Roth conversion. Or, oh, that, that works for me. Same thing with the reverse mortgages. You, you just crunch numbers. Okay, that's three sources, right? Roth, reverse mortgage, tax-free bonds. Number four, 
taking loans from cash value life insurance. Somebody has a cash value life insurance policy. Cash value life is referred to as permanent life because it'll be there to the day you die. Unlike term insurance, which has a term that it expires. So if you buy term insurance, there's no cash value inside the policy. Uh, let's say you're a farmer. You have all this equipment you just bought. And the bank says, you know, I'm worried about you dying before those tractors are paid off. They'll have you go buy term insurance, which will run for the, basically the term of the debt on the tractors. So every year as you pay off the tractors, the term insurance is tracking it. And then when the tractors are all paid off, the term, the period of time, the term is over. Insurance expires. There's no cash value. Permanent life insurance has an internal cash value savings component. So when you buy a dollar of cash value life, some of that dollar goes to buying pure insurance, the risk of insuring your life. They're laying off the bet, literally. Most insurance companies won't retain the risk. They'll reinsure it with Lloyd's of London. So you put a dollar into a cash value policy, part of that dollar, let's just use an example, 50 cents. Part of that dollar is covering the pure risk of you dying and somebody having to pay out the death benefit. But the other part of the money goes towards an internal piggy bank, cash value. So you wake up one day and you're, oh, let's just say 60 years of age, 65, whatever. And you look at your policy, your cash value policy. And by the way, there are different kinds of cash value policies. Everybody says, oh, whole life. Whole life is one kind of cash value. Variable life is a second kind of cash value. Index life is a third kind. Universal life. Cash value policies are permanent policies. They will be with you to the day you die. So you wake up in retirement and you're 65 years old and you've had this cash value policy you bought 30 years ago to take care of the kids and college and mortgage and just in case you died young. You made your premiums for 30 years and you open up your statement when you're 65 and you say, let's see, if I die, I've got half a million dollars of death benefit, which is income tax free, right? Life insurance proceeds are income tax free. If you die, you're not the winner there. But then you look in your policy and you say, I got 150,000 of cash. All these years, there's been a piggy bank. All right. Under IRS code 7702, right there in the code, it's been there forever. IRS code 7702, you're allowed to borrow off your life insurance. So you open up your policy one day, you call the insurance company, you say, could I take 500 a month out of my policy as a check? Sure. You could take virtually up to about maybe 90%. You can take a lump sum, but let's say you take a monthly check in retirement. Why is that check tax free? Anybody know? The IRS says under 7702, it's a loan. You're borrowing off your policy. Loans are not taxable events. You went and borrowed $5,000 tomorrow for anything. You wouldn't report the 5,000 as income. It's a loan. Under 7702, some of the most successful, affluent, smart people in this country, no matter what somebody will tell you, I've seen life insurance policies that had unbelievable amounts of cash inside them. And that living benefit for that person, and most people are gonna live to a ripe old age, that living benefit will come out tax free. So you call up the insurance company in retirement and you say, I wanna take a check out every month or maybe a lump sum, but let's assume a monthly check in retirement. That check is not even considered income. There's nowhere to put it on your 1040 tax return. People also use life insurance cash value for college planning. Because when they go to apply for college aid, what's the first thing that the people do? They look at their tax returns. And nowhere on their tax return is the cash value life. No matter what people will tell you, and you have to run the numbers on anything term or cash? Is it for you in the first place to even need life insurance? But you take a look inside of cash value life insurance policies, there are significant tax-free savings and they come out as loans in retirement. IRS code 7702. So what do we have, Dick? Four? 
the Roth conversion, tax-free municipal bonds, reverse. cash value life insurance, reverse mortgages. Anything else? It's a toughie. It's hard to get tax-free income in the United States. Chris, what's the next one? Take a whack at it. I have no idea. LTC is taxable. Long-term care insurance from a qualified policy. Now there's the caveat. Qualified means that the IRS has approved the way this policy is structured. That's the short story. If you buy a qualified policy, a qualified plan, anytime you hear the word qualified in the IRS code, it means the IRS has said that's okay. It qualifies for. Your IRA is a qualified plan. It qualifies for special tax treatment. Tax deductible going in. Got to take income at 59 and a half. Start income. Must take by 70 and a half. Long-term care. If unfortunately you need a long-term care policy, when you start to collect those checks from a qualified LTC, long-term care policy, home care, nursing home, assisted living facility, whatever kind of policy you have, that check is tax-free. LTC. By the way, roughly two-thirds of Americans age 65 and older will need some form of long-term care. Everyone says it won't happen to me. Probably will. Something. Something. My dad's 91. He lives with me. He fell yesterday. It's just everybody sooner or later gets to a spot where it's hard to do it all alone. Long-term care. Sixth source is a toughie. Oil and gas. If you collect a royalty from domestic, domestic oil and gas exploration, the U.S. government's very generous. They want Americans to fund and finance domestic Explorations. So we're energy independent. That's one of the reasons you have this giant oil boom in the United States the last five years. Is that you could take a check on December 31st. You're looking for a last minute deduction. If you buy the right qualified approved oil and gas exploration program in this country today, that's tax deductible going in. So you put 100000 into an oil and gas deal and it's tax deductible. Great. If you actually collect income, they hit oil, gas, whatever, or you buy into programs that are already producing, you're not doing wildcat, it's developmental, meaning you're already buying into a field that's producing or they're producing over here, so I think two miles away there's probably more. When you collect that income from your oil well, the Jed Clampett of Vero Beach, you get tax favored status. So when you collect a dollar, maybe only 70 cents is taxable. So a small portion of your income will be tax free, not 100% tax free, but it's the last place in America that when you get that check for a dollar, a little bit of it, because it's oil and gas domestically, is not taxable. Those are the six sources of tax free income in the United States. By the way, we're only covering half tonight, so hang in there. Okay. Pre-tax business assets with tax deductible dollars. Boy, that's a whopper. Anybody want to take a run at that? Pre-tax business assets with tax deductible dollars. We're going to do something here while you're still fresh called the 10 minute tax tune up. It's going to bend your mind on taxes. You'll never do your taxes the same again. Here's the bottom line. Pre-tax means what? Tax deductible, right? Your IRA was pre-tax. Your 401 k is pre-tax. You're putting in money that when you put in that dollar it's tax deductible, meaning it's pre-tax. It wasn't taxed. It'll be taxed down the road, but it wasn't taxed today. If you keep that money inside your corporation, if you buy an asset inside your corporation, your LLC, your S-Corp, your whatever, 
that is a pre-tax asset with tax deductible dollars versus bringing the dollar home, paying the tax man, and having an after-tax dollar. So you'll see very successful business owners say, well, I need a dollar to live on based on lifestyle expenses. I need a dollar in this example. Well, why would you bring home five dollars? We just did your budget. Oh, we're back to the system of a budget which includes lifestyle expenses. And the business owner tells me, based on everything I've done here in this free online software for my budget, my money tracker, I only need a dollar to live on. So let's use an example of I need 100,000 a year to live. I'll use, I'll use 5,000 a year, 5,000 a month, 60,000. So again, based on hard math, not a, not a guess, person says I need $60,000 of disposable income, not deductible. This is food and family and these are not tax deductible business expenses. This is my lifestyle costs. Take my family out to dinner tonight, it's not tax deductible. It's disposable discretionary income. Took a cruise. Everybody with me? Person needs $60,000. You said to the business owner, why are you bringing home a quarter of a million dollars? You brought a quarter of a million dollars out of your business last year when you need 60. You brought home an extra $190,000 and you paid tax on that $190,000 when you didn't need the money. You just told me you only needed 60, you brought home 250. So you paid tax on 190 and that money is gone. And now what are you gonna do with the, with the money that's left over after taxes? Gonna go put it in the bank at zero? Really smart business owners shelter inside their corporation the money they don't need to live on. They keep it inside the company pre-tax. Everybody with me? I'll give you an example. If you bought a pension plan inside your company, that's a pre-tax asset. That's exactly what I'm referring to. So if you said, well, I, I get it. I'm not going to bring home more than 60000 Where do I shelter the money? Set up a profit sharing plan. Pre-tax, tax deductible. It's an asset. It's a business asset but you're the business and you didn't bring home income you didn't need. So let me do the 10 minute tax tune up with you and this is going to fry your brain. This will be the kind of will come around third base here tonight because this is math. All right, everybody ready for this? All right. Oh, here's mine. Everybody ready for this? <laughs> All right. My dad was a doctor. Well, still is a doctor but not, not practicing. And so my entire life, I was always introduced to doctors, around doctors, worked with doctors. And if you ask a doctor, how much time you have to talk about your money? The, the proverbial standard answer all throughout history is only got 10 minutes. So doctors always only had 10 minutes. Yeah, whatever it was, you know, doctor, how much time do you have? I only got 10 minutes, all right. And you deal with them in the emergency rooms or between patients. So I'm, I'm having a little bit of fun with docs, but I said, okay, I'm going to come up with a 10-minute tax tune-up. I can find out, if you give me 10 minutes, doctor, I'll find out in 10 minutes if you're overpaying your taxes and by how much, with eight questions. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay, this math can get sticky. So stop me and ask, and then after a while, you're going to say, I got it. I did it with that gentleman I was referring to earlier, that client who came to me. And that one moment, the light bulb went off, and he's like, OMG. Everybody focuses, again, what? On the top line. Here's the philosophy here. You start at the bottom. How much do I need to live on? Not deductible money. Family money, pizza money, cruise money. But if I need 60000 coming out to live at the bottom, then I need to figure out backwards how much to bring out. And everything else I keep in the corporation. Okay, so here we go. Income taxes are generally the largest single bill in your life. I always ask the business owner, tell me a bigger bill than 40%. It's not your health care, it's not your fleet costs, it's not your rent, it's not... And is it the forever bill? Because every bill that you pay amortizes. 
your mortgage goes away, right? Amortization, college payment, car payment, mortgage payment, any payment, you're buying a building, it amortizes, but not taxes, the forever bill. All right, since they are so big and forever and non-amortizing and a variable expense, pay attention to paying the right number. So let's take a look here. And this, by the way, was a client I worked with some years ago. These are real numbers. Let's take a look at number one. The gross income for this person is a million dollars. All right, I rounded off some of the numbers, but here we go, a million dollars. Number two is what, please, Cindy? Gross business expenses. Okay, so you're running a business and your top line is a million. And you figure out all your expenses and they are, in this example, $400,000, right? So what is your net business income before taxes? You haven't brought any money home. All you've done is gross a million and pay your expenses. And you're left with how much, please, Peggy, in number three? 600000 Right. Now, at 600000 you're going to be in a 40% bracket today. 39.6, but we'll call it 40. So, Dick, if that person is in a 40% bracket and they brought home 600000 what would their taxes be? 40% of the $600,000. $240,000. Okay. So then let's take a time out and say, well, wait a second, maybe that's not the right approach. Let's stop for a second and figure out the lifestyle cost, what it really takes for you to run your life. And this person says, I need $200,000 to live. These are not deductible expenses. Again, I keep coming back to this is disposable discretionary income. So number five is 200,000. We've determined you need $200,000 to run your life, your family. Okay. Number six, the reportable gross income is what? 333 k Right, let's figure out how we got that. Everybody take a moment and read number six, please. Now number five is your lifestyle cost. I'm gonna let you read it for a second. Nobody gets this the first time. Do you have this? You want it? You're welcome. Okay, so let's go through it. Now I'm visual, I like things written out. If somebody said, I brought a calculator just for this. So somebody says, I need, you with me Chris? All right, I need 200,000, I'm sorry? Pretty light. I know, it's, wouldn't you know it? Another color. Yeah. Well, they don't want me writing with the wrong marker. I get demerits for that. All right. Better. Now, this is referred to as lifestyle costs. Not tax deductible. Again, you took your family out to dinner. You took a cruise. 200,000. All right. How much income do you need to bring home, pay the tax, and have 200,000 left over? 333 pay. Right. And the way you get there is you work what's called the inverse of your tax bracket. Now this is why I think people don't pay a lot of attention to taxes. They're like, oh my gosh, you're losing me. But once you get this, you'll have it the rest of your life and you'll never look at your taxes again. And you'll never overpay your taxes again. 
200,000 you need to live on. Well, if I'm in a 40% bracket, 0.4 of a dollar, right? A dollar of income, 100%. 40%, let's use a dollar, is 40 cents. So what's the inverse? 0.6. Okay. So what you do, Dick, you want to do this? Bang. Too bad this wasn't a credit course, huh? You'd get credit for this. <laughs> Even if it doesn't sink in right now, just kind of go with it and then you look at it again and you'll say, I got it. What you do is you take $200,000. Oh, I have a different marker, but I'm not allowed to use it. I brought my own markers, but they're not the dry erase. You take $200,000 and you divide by the inverse of your tax bracket. This is basic algebra. If your bracket's 40, the inverse is 60. If your bracket's 30, the inverse is... Right? Yeah. Yes. Let me do something similar to that when we're trying to find a company's break-even point. What must you sell in order to figure out your break-even cost and not lose money? Right. What makes this hard is you got to work backwards. You're going from Z to A. It's like whenever somebody shorts the market, people say, I understand buying stock and I buy stock at 10 and I'm long the mark as it's called. So I buy it at 10 and I sell it at 15. I made money. People have always had a hard time saying, what say? what, what's this about selling short? I sell at 10 and I buy it back at six. So I made four points in the middle, but working numbers backwards, people are just not used to. You take $200,000, you divide by 0 0.60, and you get, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring my own marker next time here. I'm not sure it's visible, but it's 333,000, which is your lifestyle cost divided by the inverse of your tax bracket. Dick, at 333,000, you bring home $333,000 of income. You're in a 40% bracket. You know where I'm going? Mm -hmm. 333,000 times 0.4 would be your taxes, but 333,000 you get to keep what? 200. Well, if you're paying 40 cents to the government of the 333, Chris, how much do you get to keep? Can I say that again? All right. Whether it's 333,000 or a dollar, you owe the U.S. government on every dollar of income 40 cents. How much is your share? 60. 60. 60 and 40 is 100%. So you bring a dollar home and the government says, give me 40 cents. And you say, rats, okay, there's my 40 cents and you've got 60, right? 60% 60 of 333,000 <throat> Well, I'll be darned. It's 199,800. If I know I need to live on 200,000, because I put my money in the system and I track it. And I know my bracket's 40 because I'm proactive. I'm in my huddle. I sit down with my tax team quarterly and I know my tax bracket. I don't take someone's word for it. I don't say, well, so-and-so handles that. You know, Elvis said that. And the colonel cleaned him out. By the way, you get cleaned out by the people you love and trust. You don't get cleaned out by strangers. Doris Day got cleaned out by her husband. You get cleaned out by the people you love and trust. Sometimes it's because they're dishonest. Sometimes it's because they're incompetent. But I use the phrase that you delegate, but you don't abdicate. When you run a huddle, you throw the ball to somebody, and that's delegating. You need teammates. But if you're not in the huddle... So whenever someone says to me, I don't know my own tax bracket, or I don't take care of that, I think to myself, that's going to end badly. This person moving on 
now knows that they need to bring home $333,000, pay 40% in taxes, keep 60%, and 60% is their $200,000. By the way, this is also one of the best ways to be bulletproof on an audit. The IRS often does what are called lifestyle audits. Sometimes an agent will drive by your house and your tax return says you're living on $19,000 and they see the driveway full of brand new expensive oh, wow. automobiles in this big house and your kids go to private school and they're like, I don't think this math adds up. One of the IRS's best ways to bust people is they'll, they'll do a drive-by. And, and your lifestyle doesn't come close to your reported income. But in this case, if this person got audited, come on by, I'll put on a pot of coffee and I'll show you my tracker with my money to the penny and I'll show you that I live on this and that's why I brought home this. I once got audited. By the way, if you ever get audited, one of the best ways to annoy the IRS when they come by. And I had my account there, but I was like, come on by. Because I always regarded an audit as basically a freebie. The government was sending out one of their best to audit my books. I hope you find something. I'll get better at it. I'm not worried about it. I'm driving 55. Cop pulls you over. What's the matter? Oh, your, your taillight's out. Oh, thank you. Thank you, officer. Okay. One of the best ways to annoy the IRS, really, and if you think about it, put yourself in the auditor's shoes, is when they come into your office or they meet with your CPA, you say, here are my files, and you give them a piece of paper. And they think to themselves, I think you're dissing me. I think you're, that's it? This is, this is what you're giving me? This thing? All right, fine. I remember that morning, and by the way, this lady became a good friend, the IRS auditor. I know her to this day. She's moved up the ranks. I've always regarded the IRS as your best friend. It's like in the securities industry and in insurance. I've always regarded the compliance people as your best friend. Most people say, oh, or, oh, they're the enemy. No, they're not. They're there to show you the right way to do it. If you diss them, that's going to annoy them. Don't tug on Superman's cape. But if you work with them respectfully and you've got nothing to hide because you drive 55, come on in. So before Phyllis came in that morning, I pulled out my legal boxes, you know, the giant and I went back as many years as I could find and I had legal boxes down to about here. I had several hundred pounds, maybe several thousand pounds of paper. She came in, I had a pot of coffee ready, nice to meet you, my CPA was there and I'll never forget, she walked into the conference room and there was a bit of a step down, kind of a sunken and she walked in and I could see her like, First thing she thought was, I, I don't think he has anything to hide. There's enough paper here to insulate us in a nuclear attack. And the second thing that any normal person would think of, and again, I'm not trying to play games, but the second thing any normal person would think of if you were an auditor was, oh wow, this is a lot of work. Now auditors get paid on a compensation system. They're trying to get as much money as they can, as quickly as they can, and get out of there because they got another file on their desk. But if you understand how the IRS works, they're basically working on commission. So if an auditor walks in, and unless you're a gazillionaire, and if they see 16,000 pounds of paper, A, you have nothing to hide, and B, oh wow, I gotta get out of here. That's how you deal with an IRS audit, is you drive 55. Treat them respectfully and give them everything under the sun. Okay, so let's get back to the tax tune-up. So we know now in number six, we finished number six. And what's the last sentence in number six, please? It says, only bring home the pre-tax income that it takes to pay for your after-tax lifestyle cost. So we've established that, right? But if 333,000 is what this man needs, what was this man bringing home before? 
Well, he was bringing home what? Way too much. 600,000 600, times, but hit the number now, the 600,000 wasn't what he brought home. 600,000 at 60 percent. Right? Yeah. But you, everybody with me? Okay, so let's move on. 600,000 at 40 percent, isn't it? Oh, he paid, he would have paid he, taxes 40 percent. Right, he gets to keep the 60. Inverse of the bracket. By the way, this is what's referred to. And again, folks, this is so important. I know it's sticky, but you'll get it. And I'll, you'll be back next week, and you can bring questions, and you'll read this a few times. But income taxes are the largest single bill in your life, the forever bill. Master this. And I know this is kind of like, ugh. But once you're through the groan zone, as I call it, you get it. And you'll never do your taxes again the same way in business. OK. By the way, just if it makes it simple, You'll hear this terminology in taxes. Chris, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Hard dollar, soft dollar. A dollar of income isn't yours. Some of it belongs to the US Treasury. By the way, another great way to really annoy the IRS and, and end up in prison <laughs> is, and virtually, well, Don't pay no, make the argument that taxes are unconstitutional and watch what happens to the judge. Yeah, I, so when someone says, well, you know, I never should have to pay that, you go down that road. That's like saying to the officer, you know, I think stop signs are a silly idea. And red lights, that's for chickens. Hard dollar, soft dollar. Hard dollar is yours, soft dollar is the government. 40% bracket here, let's work with this person, right? Hard dollar, 60 cents is yours. The soft dollar was never your money. Hard dollar, soft dollar, hard dollar, soft dollar. Inverse of the bracket, inverse of the bracket. Okay? So, moving on. Number seven. Cindy, take a run at this for me. $267,000. Number three is the 600000 minus number six. In other words, instead of bringing home 600,000, bring home 333. Questions? You bring home 600,000 is too much. 333 is the right number. So if you're not bringing home 600,000, which is where I met you, we go through this exercise and you say, well, if I bring home only 333, 600 minus 333 is 257. So you're telling me, phrase, that I should leave 257. I'm sorry, was I off of my own math? Thank you. Thank you. I, was just a, I was testing you. I was making sure that people were paying attention to the 10 minute tax tune up, or it's my eyesight going here. All right. So the person says, I get it. I live on 200. I do the inverse of my bracket, I do the exercise, I need 333 of taxable income, but I'm currently bringing home 600. I'm bringing home $267,000 of taxable income for no good reason. Maybe I should keep that 267 in the corp pre-tax. With me? All right, let's take it one step further. And the person says, I got it. Everybody with me? Okay, this is not easy stuff, so if you're with me, good for you. If you keep $267,000 in the corp, take a look at number eight, please. Well, if you didn't pay taxes bill on 267, because we kept it sheltered in your corporation, legally, with pre-tax business assets. If you did not pay taxes at 40% on 267, 40% is your tax bracket, right? You just didn't pay taxes on 267 because you didn't bring home 600, you brought home 333. Well, if you don't pay taxes on 
40% of 267. 267 thousand dollars that you're not bringing home as income times go ahead please times what 40 percent times 0. 0.4 yeah. I, I, I'm an educator the best thing an advisor can do for people in the world is give them knowledge so that the rest of your days you don't say uh, my so-and-so handles it you say no he taught me 267 times 0.4 is what you would have paid in taxes, I'm sorry, Cindy, unnecessarily. If you keep $267,000 legally inside your corporation and you didn't pay 40% on 267, I just saved you $107,000 roughly in taxes. Let's take it one step further as to what kind of a percentage gain that is. Remember I said to you at the beginning of the course that if you can incrementally save a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there, that's how you squeeze your business. It's like winning lotto. It's probably not going to happen. You're not going to have one giant windfall in your corporation where you saved a zillion. You're going to save a little here and a little there. Every year I shop my insurance for auto and I might save 10 or 15 percent and 10 or 15 percent here or 5 percent there or 5 percent there. Cumulatively, that's how you squeeze your business books where they sing. You run your business like a Swiss watch. I want you to read the rest of this on your own, please, and we'll wrap this up for tonight. We're right on time. I want you to read the rest of this because it gets into the percentage gain. I'm going to take you through this last piece. Then we'll, the last the section five for tonight, we'll wrap it up. We're just about on time, too. People say to me, I'm going to go earn 4% of the bank, or I'm going to try and earn 8% in the stock market. By the way, the historical rate of return in the stock market over the last 500 years, the last 100 years, is roughly 8%, the S&P 500. So someone says, I've invested in stocks. Well. If the next 100 years is anything like the last 100 years and you're investing in the S&P 500, you're going to get somewhere between 7 and 9%. You can go online and Google it yourself. Historical rate of return, S&P 500, 7 to 9%. With reinvested dividends, call it 8%. Okay. How much did you just make here? You made 66% tax-free. Let's figure out how we did it. And we'll call it an evening. Anybody have a headache yet on this stuff? <laughs> All right. And I'm going to do this for the audience as well. In this hypothetical example, you paid $133,000 in income tax, which was 40% times your reportable income of $133,000. Remember, we brought home $333,000, which is the right number. Now, before this tax tune-up, you were going to pay $240,000 in income tax, 40% of $600,000, the $600,000 you didn't need. So instead of reportable income of 600,000, you reported 333, 333,000, and you left 267,000 in the corporation as pre-tax income. By keeping 267,000 in your corporation pre-tax, you've saved $106,800 $106, of otherwise lost tax dollars. How did you get to 106? It was 40% of the 267 you didn't bring home. Where'd the 267 hang out, Lewis? Back in the corporation. Back in the corporation. corporation. Okay. You then add the 106,800 of soft tax dollars you saved to your hard tax dollars of $160,000, which is the 60%. 
You got to see it. It's easier when you see it. Well, if you've kept 106,800 divided by 267, that's a 66% rate of return. Now, you taxed on that 66%? No, all you did was tax planning. That's not a taxable event. You didn't pay essentially $107,000 in taxes. And if you do the math here, and I know it's hard on the camera because you can't see it, if you follow this math through, your effective rate of return here was 66%. And it was tax free, it was also instant. The moment you decided to do this exercise and not bring home the extra income, you saved $107,000 in taxes. If you do the math here, that $107,000 equates to a 66% rate of return on your money. It was instant, it was tax free, and it was guaranteed, and it was annual. Never look at your taxes the same way again. What you want to do on the 10 minute tax tune up, and you're welcome to take some extras is take it home, grind through it on your own numbers. It's hard to do it if you don't have your money in a system to begin with because you don't know your lifestyle costs. So that's where it starts. When you come back next week, I'll answer questions on this. But it comes back to, again, overpaying your income taxes is not only a bad idea and unnecessary, but saving on your income taxes I don't, know what, I don't know where else I could get you 66% tax free like that. The moment you don't bring the income home and you don't bring home the extra 267, you've just saved $107,000. You kept the money growing in your corporation, by the way, because it went into something. I was going to say, what could you put in? New equipment. That. A qualified plan, again, means that the IRS has qualified it, approved it. Your long-term care policy is qualified. The IRS has blessed it as, yep, it meets all of the right criteria, it follows the code, it qualifies for special tax treatment. These are the contribution limits for 2015. 401 k is $18,000 tax deductible. 457 is a code section for firefighters and police. An IRA. 5,500 is the contribution today. If you're past 50, they give you 6,500. By the way, some of these have income formulas. You can't make this. and you, We could get off in the weeds on that. So it's case specific, but at least you know where we're talking about sheltering this money. Simple IRAs. Self-employed pension, profit-sharing plan. Anybody know something, notice something interesting about those plans? Whoa, 210,000? I didn't think you could do that much in a plan. Every single one of these plans, a 401k, a 457, an IRA, a simple, a SEP, a profit-sharing, are called defined contribution plans. We're defining your contribution. It's $18,000. It's $5,500. The limit for my profit sharing plan, which I own, is $53,000. Then you run across somebody outsized who says, that's nothing. I need to shelter $267,000 based on this example. A defined benefit plan isn't about defining the contribution, it's about defining what comes out. And what the IRS says is that we're going to use actuarial tables. So if you're 55 years old and we're going to define your benefit as you want $1,000 a month at age 65, and we're going to use a guaranteed rate of return of maybe only two or three, if you want to get there by 65, and we're going to use these guaranteed rates of two or three, very low rates of assumption, then we know that you've got to put in this to define the benefit. Not a lot of people know about these plans. They're right in the IRS code. They're defined benefit. 
again, you're talking about a certain profile that says, phrase, $5,500 is like throwing a tennis ball at a tank. I need serious deductions. By the way, what if that person said to me in this example, okay, I've got a shelter, how much? 267, right? 210 leaves me $57,000 short. Take a good hard look, right there in the code, and you wouldn't be the first person in America to invest tax deductible pre-tax dollars into domestic oil and gas exploration. Can you only do one of those? Yes, yeah, yeah, you couldn't, <laughs> well if you could. But I mean, could you do a profit sharing and a defined benefit? No. And again, there are income levels where if you make a certain amount of money, you can't do an IRA and get a deduction. You'll notice a Roth is not there because a Roth is not pre-tax dollars. A Roth is an after-tax contribution which pays out tax-free. But defined benefit plans are outsized and then you could come up with some excess if you need to in domestic oil and gas exploration. May not be suitable for everybody, may not be the right program for somebody. You gotta be very careful in oil and gas that you're doing what the IRS says. There's a lot of hucksters and shysters. I get calls all the day from people out of Texas and you know, I got this great deal and oil and gas sounds great. The devil's in the details. But those plans are available, those investments are available pre-tax. Your best rate of return, pre-tax investing. I just showed you how to get 66% and you didn't lose any sleep or any money. Again, the moment you didn't write the check to the IRS and you kept that 107,000 in the corporation and you saved money, the moment you don't pay the tax and bring the money home, you just made an instant 66%. And that's not hocus pocus. I use this example, the story of the four quarters. There's a dollar of income, right? And in this example, 50 cents is your hard dollar. And in this example, 50 cents is the soft dollar. We use an example of a 50% tax bracket. Okay. You make a dollar. You get to keep 50 cents hard dollar, and in a 50% bracket, this goes to the U.S. Treasury. Your rate of return is a canceled check, right? Guaranteed. Okay. Somebody says to me, that's a bad idea, and I don't need that much money. I can live on less. Okay. U.S. Treasury says, I'll meet you halfway. Give me back the 50 cents. And if you invest in a profit sharing plan, if you put your skin in the game, if you put your hard dollar in, and you don't go spend it on a cruise, you don't go spend it on anything after tax disposable, you don't bring it home, if you invest in America, if you save, by the way, this is public policy. If you take a look at the thrust of this, they're trying to get people to save for their own retirement. They're giving you an incentive. Don't go spend the money. Save it somewhere. Buy a profit sharing plan, invest it somewhere. If you put your 50 cents in, we'll take our 50 cents and match you. We won't cash that check. We'll meet you in the middle. Everybody with me? 50 cents on 50 cents is what rate of return, Dick? 100%? And 50%? No, it's 100. 100. Now the moment you say, that's a darn good idea. I'm going to open up a profit sharing plan and here's my 50 cents back and the government says well then here's my 50 cents. That took how long? Years to make that rate of return? Any risk? Is there any risk here? No, it's in the code. Drive 55. So there's no risk. It was instant. It was a taxable event. No, you're simply allowing yourself to follow public policy, what the IRS says is allowed. You took 50 cents, they're 50 cents, you met in the middle, you married the money, you just made 100% tax-free, instant, guaranteed. Someone's got a better rate of return, let me know. 
taxes 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 all throughout history the smart money the really smart money has always said it starts with taxes you can't invest what you don't have there's no investment in the world that's any good if you just sent that 50 cents to the Treasury you can't invest it it all starts with taxes I'll finish here for tonight we're done I know we started a bit late when we'll finish a bit late I'm sorry and then we'll pick it up next week cost audits business owners don't do it's a very simple philosophy and I'll wrap this up in less than five minutes when I sit down with a business owner I say get me every single expense you pay whether it's a one-time bill but usually there's regularity it's your insurance bills your telecom your cable your rent your payroll think of any bill in any business they're almost always paid over and over and over there's some one-off bills you bought a tractor you're not buying another tractor next month but even if you did buy a tractor I want to take a look at that bill cost audits look back for mistakes there are people and I have this referral network who do nothing but say give me your bills and they go squirrel away in a room with the green visor and they're looking back they're auditing your expenses for mistakes give a perfect example there was a client years ago that owned a ton of property and there was this one bill that just seemed outsized so the client and again by the way this all comes back to what's making us look at your bills we're putting them in a system and if we don't put your bills in a system your expenses in a system we can't do the 10 minute tax tune up it all comes back to a system a system a system so we took the bills and there are people who make a living working on contingency fees they only get paid if they find you mistakes it's like looking back in your bank statement somebody says give me your bank statement for the last three years you go back to your business and if I find any mistake in your bank statement your utility bill your water bill your telecom bill your payroll I'll go back as far as the law allows and again different bills different states there's a certain statutes you can't go back forever but you can go back a little bit anytime you dispute a charge with the bank what do they say you gotta let us know within 60 days right so anytime you look back on a bill you got a certain amount of time again different bills different laws different states but let's assume you can go back usually you can go back a fair amount of time usually years not a lot of years but not months what this person found and I brought this person in I don't do this I know these people I'm the guy who takes you to the guy sometimes that's my role if I don't do it directly because of my license or my expertise I know someone who does it's like I said at the beginning I've either seen it or I've done it or I know where to find it bottom line when this man had bought a real estate development that was being built and the city was laying roads and it was brand new when everything was done the city had forgotten or somebody neglected intentionally air of omission commission to take the lights on that entire road back to the city it was the city's road the lights on that road were the city's responsibility but it was on his bill for years until this person that I brought in said that's not your bill that's their bill now sometimes you have to litigate and sometimes it's just a question of presenting like the facts this man recouped well over six, a lot of money a lot of money cost audits look back cost reduction is about drilling down your bills going forward audits avoid waste and fraud sometimes it's not an error of omission sometimes that's how you find out you're being embezzled that's how you find out that the bookkeeper isn't taking 10,000 a week they're taking 200 for the last 27 years again you wake up every day gotta go make the money top line 
shovel that money, shovel that money, make that money, make that money. Where's it going? Literally, over your shoulder, making, making money, making money, making money, making money, not paying any attention. Spending my day doing this. Left hand, no right hand. Once you get your audits down, your bills are going to be squeaky. And going forward, cost reduction is a dream. Because you've already done it by cleaning up behind you. Audits are also loss prevention. Again, embezzlement. Or the payroll company is just making a mistake. It wouldn't be the first time. You get your bank statement. You assume it's correct. I don't. I read mine. Here's the best part. We'll close off tonight. Audits are done, cost recovery, on a contingency fee. So you say to somebody, here are my bills. A giant box of all my bills. Go lock yourself in my office over there, and I'm going to go back to my business. And get back to me. And if they find no mistakes and nothing to save you, they charge you zero. But if they find a dollar and they actually then help you recover the dollar, because that's also part of their job is, well now how do we go to the state and the city and the municipality or the locality and the electric company and say, uh, this whole street of lights that you've been charging my client for is not his bill. That's kind of step two is then presenting the facts, the forensics. Maybe there has to be litigation, usually not. Usually if it's done properly, the other side says, well, son of a gun, you're right. And you're within the statute. Darn it, we owe you. If that person saves you a dollar, they'll charge you maybe 10, 20, 25, whatever. What does it matter? What they whatever they charge you, you're gonna be richer after you pay them, but then before you met them. So if I found you a dollar and said my fee is 50 cents, which I've never seen that high, you'd come back with 50 cents. You've also stopped the bleeding, because going forward now, I'm not making that mistake anymore. And if you ask business owners if they have ever looked back, they're like, no, I'm too busy waking up and running with my head down. Let's wrap it for tonight. We have the other modules next week. Hopefully I gave you a headache. Your head should be swimming. It's, it's, you're almost at a spot of too much information, but I always like to close as a courtesy to the client with questions. We're done on my side for tonight but anything, 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 questions, comments, feedback, concerns. Clear? Not entirely, but that's the homework. My math major here will <laughs> For the audience, making money and managing money are two different things. And managing money is actually, once you get through this, because once you understand the 10 minute tax tune up, you've got it for life. Once you clean up cost recovery, you're done. So there's a groan zone here as I call it. But once you get through it, it's like I'm free. And managing money is actually easier and more profitable than making it. The hardest thing in business is a new client Right? Everybody knows that? The acquisition of a new client versus just saying, well, this dollar I just earned, maybe I should pay attention to it. That's what this course is all about, raising your net. And some of the things we did tonight were what? Tax-free. Cost recovery can be tax-free because you're simply recovering money you overpaid. It's not a taxable event. It's not income. If you find an error on your bank statement for $50, you don't report that to the IRS. That's simply your own money coming back to you. Okay? Thank you. Good job. I have a headache. Good job. <laughs>